Hi, it's good to be back. Thank you all for being here. Without doubt, Microsoft Exchange Server is the most widely deployed mail solution within governments and enterprises. It is an integration of their daily operations and security. This January, we report a series of vulnerabilities on Exchange Server to Microsoft and named it as Proxy Logon. If you are paying attention to the industry news, you must have heard this name. Proxy Logon may be the most severe vulnerability in the Exchange history ever. However, as we went into deep dive on Proxy Logon, it came to us that it is not just a single bug, but a whole new attack service to help researchers to uncover more vulnerabilities. To unveil the beauty of this attack service, we will start from explaining the architecture, analyzing the root cause, and ending up with A vulnerabilities we found. By understanding the basics of this new attack service, you won't be surprised why we can pop out zero deaths easily. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Orange, and now the principal security researcher at DEF Core. I'm a zero day researcher and focusing on web and application security. My job is to find out the most severe vulnerabilities that can impact the world ahead of the bad guys and report them to the vendors directly. Apart from that, I'm also a speaker, CTF player, and bug bounty hunter. I got several awards from my researchers, such as the Pony Awards and the Champion of the Pound to Own. If you are interested, welcome to follow my Twitter and blog. Before I get started, here is the disclaimer. All the CVEs mentioned today have been reported responsibly and have been patched by Microsoft. So why were we targeting Exchange Server? In terms of enterprise security, mail servers are high value assets since they are the place to keep corporate confidentials. With that being said, if someone controls the mail server, they can dominate the lifeline of the corporation. Exchange Server is the most well-known and important mail solution in the world. With this in mind, Exchange has also been the top target for nation-state hackers for a long time. Based on our research, there are more than 400,000 Exchange servers exposed on the internet. Every server represents a company. You can imagine how severe it could be when there is a critical vulnerability on Exchange server. Normally, I will review the existing papers and bugs before starting a research. Among the whole exchange history, is there any interesting bug? Of course, also most bugs are based on known attack service, such as the deserialization or input validation. There are several bugs that are worth mentioning. The most special one is the Arsenal from Equation Group in 2017. It's the only practical and public pre auth RCE in the exchange history. Unfortunately, the Arsenal only works on an ancient exchange server. If the Arsenal leak happened earlier, it could lead to another nuclear label crisis. Among all, I would say the most surprising one is CVE 2020-06AA. The nature of this bug is a hard-code crypto key. This also shows that Exchange is lacking security review. It's 2020 now. Such a common weakness could still be found in a crucial software. 
which inspired me to dig more into the security of exchange. So what have we done? We have reviewed the exchange security from the architectural levels and find a new attack service. Through this new attack service, we uncovered A vulnerabilities and chained these bugs into three attacking exploits. The first and the most famous one is proxy logon. It's a pre auth RCE. The second one is proxy oracle. It's an exploit that can recover any user's password in plain text format. The last one is the proxy shell. It's the exploit we demonstrated at Pound to Own 2021. It's also a pre auth RCE. I would like to highlight that all vulnerabilities we've uncovered here are logic bugs, which means they could be reproduced and exploited easily than any memory corruption bugs. Here is my bug list. The ones in red indicate the bug is related to the attack service directly, and others are the bugs we checked together. A side note that we report one more bug in June. Since the bug is still patching, we will not share its detail today. For your references, there are other bugs related to this attack service. You can see from this table, NSA and nation state hackers are also playing that which means the attack service we share today is a critical hit for Exchange Server. Exchange is a very sophisticated application. Before we cut to the chats, let me introduce the architecture first. Since 2000, Exchange has released a new version every three years. Whenever Exchange released a new version, the architecture changes a lot and becomes different. The change of architecture and iterations make it difficult to upgrade an exchange server. In order to ensure the compatibility between the new architecture and old ones, several design steps were incurred and led to the new attack service we found. So where did we focus? We focus on the client access service, CAS. CAS is a fundamental component in Exchange. The official document indicates CAS is a front end that accepts client connections for all protocol and responsible for routing and proxying connections. CAS was where we paid attention to and where the attack service existed. Because the CAS is located at a very early stage of exchange request processing, all bugs here are authentication free. You can imagine how dangerous it is when this fundamental service is vulnerable. Here is the CAS architecture copied from the document. As you can see, the left side is the clients. No matter where the connect connection comes from, either HTTP, POP3, IMAP, or SMTP, CAS in the middle part processes all connections and proxies to the backend service on the right side. The backend service will continue to handle further business logics. Because I specialize in web security, so we focus on the web part. The CNS web is built on Microsoft IIS. As you can see, there are two websites inside the IIS. The default website is the front end we mentioned before, and the exchange backend is where the business logic is. If you look at the configuration carefully, 
you will notice the front end is listening on post 80 and 443. And the back end is listening on the post 81 and 444. It should be noted that the posts are exposed on all interfaces. You may sense something wrong here. All the posts are open to all interfaces, which means you can access the backend directly. Wouldn't it be dangerous? Please keep this question in mind and we will answer that later. The CNS is composed of several IS modules. Applications in front end include the proxy module which is responsible for passing all incoming requests, applying protocol-specific settings, and forwarding them to the backend. As for the backend, applications include the rehydration module, which is taking charge of passing front-end requests, populating the client information back, and continue the business logic. Here is a question for you. How did the front end and back end exchange the information? They synchronize the information and inter internal status HTTP headers. For a client request, it will first be handled by the front end, and the request will be passed through several IS modules, such as the filter, validation, logging and the last proxy module. The proxy module then picks up a handler based on the current application paths, such as the slash OWA and slash ECP. The handler will do the proxy work and forward the request to the backend. When the backend receives the request, it passes the request to the rehydration module to restore the original client set and continue the business logics. So our idea is simple. Could we access the backend intentionally? Since the exchange synchronized the information by HTTP headers, and it seems like most of the access control is done by the front end. If we can access the backend without restrictions, Maybe there are several internal APIs we can abuse. We all know that implementing a proxy isn't easy, and the front end seems like a real implement HTTP client. If there are some magic tricks to manipulate the context between the front end and the back end, it must be fun. In order to abuse the context, we have to know how the proxy module works first. The proxy request handler is the most important part of the front end. All handlers should inherit this class to implement their methods, such as how to handle the client cookies and headers, and how to proxy the client request to the backend. We separate the methods into three sections. The first is request, which will pass and modify the client request. Next is proxy section, which will proxy and send the HTTP request to the backend. And the last section is response. This section will receive the response from the backend and decide which header or a cookie should be sent back to the client. Because this handler is important, we will explain the methods one by one. The first method of request is copy headers to server request. It will decide which HTTP headers from the client can be sent to the backend. As we said, the front end and back end synchronize information and internal status by HTTP headers. Maybe you are thinking I could forge the headers to confuse something. This is a nice try, but unfortunately, you can see here is a backlist in the method. The front end blocked several HTTP headers which are used internally. 
Please keep in mind that the header X common access token is an important one. You will learn this later. The second is copy cookies to server request. The functionality is the same as the previous one, but it copies cookies instead. The last method of request section is add protocol specific headers to server request. This method allows a handler to apply customized protocol settings. For example, if the front-end OWA would like to pass information to the backend, here is the place it can insert information to headers. Besides the customized protocol settings, this method also clones the user identity to a new HTTP header. The identity is the client authentication results in IIS also consisting of your security identifier. The method serializes it to a string and puts it into the headers, which will be forwarded to the backend later. As for now, you know how the front end and backend synchronize your identity. They do it by the header X common access token. Once the request passing is done, it will lead to the proxy section. The proxy first uses the get target backend server URL to calculate the URL where the front end should send to. This method is also a buggy class and full of vulnerabilities. We will discuss this later. The second step of proxy is create server request, which first initializes an HTTP client, sets up the HTTP method and headers, and forwards it to the backend. We mentioned that pros in IIS are open to anyone, and this is dangerous. So that's why Exchange has a mechanism to avoid the situation. While the front end is creating a request, it will generate a Kerberos ticket and put it in the authorization header. This header will be sent to the backend along with the request. So how does the backend know which connection is from a valid front end? By verifying this Kerberos ticket. We look into the generate Kerberos OS header and note that the header is generated with the HTTP SPN of the Exchange Machine account. If you observe the traffic between the front end and back end, you will see two headers shown in the request. One is the authorization header, which is the Kerberos ticket used to indicate you are a valid front end. The other is the header X common access token. It's a serialized token indicates your identity. For example, if you log in with the name Orange, the header is the serialized result of your security identifier. After sending the request to the backend, the front end receive the response and enter the last section. The response section is similar to request. It checks the response from the backend and decide which headers or cookies are allowed to be sent back to the client. Now you understand how the front end works. Let's move on to see how the backend process and populates the request from the front end. The backend rehydration module first uses the method to check whether the incoming request is authenticated or not. It is the time to leverage the Kerberos ticket the front end generate. By handing over the ticket, the backend knows you are a valid front end node. 
the backend then called the Mesa try get common access token to restore the user's identity from the front end. The Mesa retrieves the header, deserializes it back to the original access token, and puts it in the HTTP context object for later use. So far, you learned how the front end and back end synchronize the user's identity, and how the header X common access token plays an important role in the CAS architecture. Since the method just checks if the users are logging or not, it doesn't check the identity. Here comes a question. Could we authenticate as a normal user in the backend? If we access the backend directly and authenticate with a normal account, we can specify whatever values in the header X common access token and impersonate as any users. The idea is good, and actually, you can test the IIS authentication of the backend. But there is one more checkpoint. The method is token serialization allowed, verifies the current log user, and rests a rehydration exception if the checkpoint is failed. It checks if you have a token serialization right. By default, only the Exchange Machine account has this right. So that's why the Kerberos ticket generated by front-end can pass the checkpoint, but you will fail even if you are using the correct credential. Here is a quick summary for you. When there is a client request, the front-end IIS first tries to authenticate the request. If it succeeds, the front end serializes the user identity and adds it into the header X common access token. The front end then generates a Kerberos ticket by its HTTP SPN and puts it into the authorization header. It will forward these headers along with the client request to the backend. The backend also tries to authenticate the request at the beginning. The rehydration module will verify whether the user have the right of token serialization or not. Since we are using a Kerberos ticket generated by the front end, we passed. Lastly, the rehydration restores the user identity from the header X common access token and continues the backend business logic. So far, we briefly explained the communication between the front end and back end. Let's start the head. Okay, the first exploit is proxy logout. As introduced before, this may be the most severe vulnerability in the exchange history. Proxy logout is chat with two bugs to get RCE. One is an SSRF on the front end and the other is an arbitrary file write on the control panel of the backend. So here is the proxy logout. The bug is mainly located at the proxy section in the front end. We mentioned that the front end handler calculates the backend URL and forwards the request to that URL. One of the handlers is in charge of processing the static resources. It will assign the backend target from the cookie. You will figure out how simple this bug is after learning the architecture. The front end treats the user supplied cookie as the domain name, and the domain name will be concatenated as the backend URL. We use a bit of passing tricks to enclose the URL and force the exchange to fetch example.com. The exchange will then return the whole response back to us. So what is the root cause of this arbitrary backend assignment? As we mentioned that the exchange server changed its architecture while releasing new versions. 
This cookie is a quick solution for Exchange to make the front end in new architectures to identify where the old backend is. It looks like a design depth to adapt backward compatibility. With this backend assignment, we have a super SSI that can control almost all the requests and get all the responses. The most impressive is that it will generate a Kerberos ticket for us, which means even when we are taking a protected and domain joined HTTP service, we can still hack with the authentication of Exchange Machine account. Thanks to the Super SSRF, we can leverage the internal API slash proxy logon.ecp to get a valid session to access the control panel. The API is also the reason why we call it proxy logon. As for the rest of exploitation, I believe there are already lots of technical analysis out there. We will skip it today for the consideration of time. We will not do the demonstration today, but if you are interested, welcome to check the demo on our website. Next, I will be sharing details about Proxy Oracle. Compared to Proxy Logon, Proxy Oracle is an interesting exploit with a different approach. Proxy Oracle will allow the attacker to recover the victim's plain text password simply by leading them to a malicious link. We use a cross-site scripting and padding Oracle to complete the exploit. First, we would like to explain how the OWA or ECP authenticate users. If the native IIS authentication is used, an ugly prompt will pop out asking you to enter the password instead of this fancy interface, which means Exchange is using a certain mechanism to ask you the transformation between the credentials and cookies. So let's take a look at how this fancy interface is working with the original architecture. Let's get back to the CLS architecture. All the OWA and ECP login mechanism is done by the phone-based authentication module. The FBA is an authentication module prior to the exchange front end and responsible for converting the username and password into cookies or translating cookies back to the original credential pairs. The implementation stores your username and password in cookies directly. Of course, the cookie is encrypted to avoid bad guys catching your password in plain text on the fly. If you read the login traffic carefully, you will see several cookies which stand for your identity. For the later mail operations, you have to attach cookies to identify who you are. Among all cookies, there are five important ones with the prefix CA data. You can see from the screen, the CA data contains your encrypted username and password. Here's the pseudo code for the encryption logic. Exchange generates to random strings as the IV and key for every session. The IV and key will be sent and stored on the client side. However, to avoid someone stealing the cookies and decrypting with the IV and key, Exchange uses RSA to encrypt with its private key again before sending. Exchange then uses the AES to encrypt your encoded credential with the IV and key and put the result into the cookies. And yes, you can find padding oracle here. Exchange tags the CBC as its padding mode. If you are familiar with cryptography, you must know that CBC is vulnerable to the padding oracle attack. 
The exchange implementation catches the padding error exception and returns immediately. When the logging process fails, Exchange redirects the HTTP back to the login patch with an error code. Due to the return, we have an oracle here. If the encryption fails, the error code is zero, which stands for now. And if we corrupt the ciphertext successfully, the exchange will try to log in with the corrupted credential pattern. At this moment, the result must be a failure and the error code is 2, which stands for the invalid credentials. By differing from the error number, we have an oracle to recover the plain text. Now we know we can decrypt any cookies with the padding oracle. But the problem is how to get the cookies from the return. In order to get a cookie on clients, we uncover a cross-site scripting to chain together. But it comes up with another problem. In Exchange, all sensitive cookies are protected by HTTP only, so we can't access the cookies by JavaScript. So what can we do? Since we can execute arbitrary JavaScript on client side, why don't we just insert the SSI cookie, which is used in proxy lookup? Once we add a cookie to the browser, we can sniff and take over all the user's mail operations request. All we need to do is sit on our server and wait for the cookies to come back. I will elaborate the process further. We first send a malicious link to the victim. Once the victim triggers our process scraping, we insert the SSI cookie to pretend we are the backend of Exchange. Then the Exchange server becomes the proxy between the victim and us. We will take over all the traffic and bypass the HTTP only to get encrypted cookies. Okay, the demonstration. First, we have the victim, and we pass his mail address to our exploit. The exploit first sends a malicious link to the target. Once the target triggers our cross-site scraping, we insert the SSI cookie and wait for the connection back to obtain the encrypted cookies. Okay, we got a connection. We can now decrypt the blocks by padding Oracle. It should be noted that all the decryption could be done without the cross site scraping. Even the user closed the browser, we can still recover the password. With a little bit waiting, we recover the password in plain text successfully. The last exploit I will share today is proxy share. This is the exploit we demonstrated at Pound2On 2021. The result of proxy share is the same as proxy logout. An unauthenticated attacker can execute arbitrary commands on the exchange server. But the exploit chain is different. Proxy share is chained with an SCL bypass in the front end an uh, elevation of privilege in the exchange PowerShell backend, and an arbitrary file write to get the RCE. So where is the proxy shell? The first pre auth block is also located at the backend URL calculation. Proxy shell begins with a pass confusion. Exchange has a feature called the explicit logon feature. This feature is used to display another user's mailbox or calendar in a new browser window. Of course, the display mailbox must have to be configured with permission to publish first. 
in order to open with a single GET request, the URL format must be simple and the mailbox address must be included in the URL, such as the highlight part in the slide. The exchange normalizes the spatial URL and reroutes it to the existing handlers. Of course, the path is not the only way to specify the mailbox pages. We find that through the specific cast in the auto discover handler, Exchange will consider address from the query stream if the path ends with slash auto discover.json. After getting the address, the handler tries to normalize the URL. You see that Exchange won't conduct too much checking on the pattern of the removing mailbox address, which led us to use the substring to erase any part of the URL. As you could see from the slide, this is the URL we will be visiting. And this is the mailbox address we use the query string to specify. Here is the part will be removed from exchange according to our pattern. With the erase. This is the actual URL the request will be sent to the backend. As for now, we can access any exchange backend again. Also, this bug is not as powerful as the SSIF in proxy logout. It's sufficient to access arbitrary backends. We tried to access the NAPI in the face to identify our privilege. From the screenshot, you could see that we did access the backend with the exchange system privilege again. Here comes the post exploitation part. The approach of original proxy logon fails because of some in-depth protections. So we have to discover a new approach. Now let's turn the focus to the exchange PowerShell remoting, a feature for exchange automations. Through the defined PowerShell commands, users can read mail, send mail, and even configure settings via command lines. The Exchange PowerShell implementation is built upon the PowerShell API. By coding the API, Exchange could realize a PowerShell server and use the run space to limit and isolate the command execution. All the operations are based on the WinRM protocol. And it should be noted that also we can access the PowerShell backend directory. We can't still interact with it because we are the system user. We will fail the authentication since there is no mailbox for the system user. We also can't forge the identity by the X common access token header due to the blacklist in the front end. So what should I do? We dive into the PowerShell server implementation and find a piece of code that extracts the access token from the URL. The code is sitting after the IIS backend authentication and before the rehydration. It checks if there is no X common access token the code will code out another method to get access token from URL. The common access token from URL is a short method and retrieves the value of XRPS CAT from query stream, then deserialize it back to the access token. As for now, we have an elevation of privilege because we can access the PowerShell backend and specify the access token directly. The intention of this operation is to be a quick proxy for internal exchange PowerShell communication. By abusing this feature, we can impersonate as any user. Here, we use this EOP to downgrade ourselves from the instant user we saw mailbox to exchange admin. 
Now we can execute arbitrary exchange power shield commands as admin. And then the last piece of the puzzle is to find a post of RCE to chain everything together. Because we are the admin and there are hundreds of exchange power shield commands out there, it's easy to find a post of book. We abuse the command new mailbox explore request to export a user's mailbox into the web loop to be our web shield. We can create files on arbitrary paths. The next problem is how to embed our malicious payload into the file. It's also easy. We can deliver our payload by mail. However, the exported file is encoded. By reading the Microsoft document, we learn it's in PST format, and the encoding is just a simple table mapping. We can just encode the payload before sending out. While the server tries to save and encode our payload, it turns into the original malicious code. Let's turn everything together. We first deliver our encoded web shell to the target mailbox. We then launch a Windows PowerShell client to connect to our proxy server. We use a proxy because we have to modify the WinRN protocol to rewrite the path lead to the vulnerable auto-discover handle, which will eventually trigger the path confusion bug and add the access token to the query stream. Once our session has been established, we can ask you the PowerShell command to grant ourselves to the mailbox explore load and invoke the mailbox exploding and enjoy the shell. Okay, let's go to the demonstration of the proxy shell. So this is the exchange server and we run our exploit code. The exploit first sent our encoded payload to the mailbox and launched the PowerShell to establish the WinRN connection. We use a server to rewrite the traffic to implement our exploit. Okay, our shell is dropped. And you can see we are the same step. Let's talk about mitigations. Since it's an architectural problem, it's hard to mitigate a tax service with one single action. All you can do is keep your exchange up to date and with the support of a firewall or SEL to not externally facing the internet. Microsoft has enhanced the CAS architecture in April. The authentication part of this attack service has been reduced in the patch. If you are lazy, freeze up the Apple patch at least. And if you are super lazy, maybe you can give a shot at Office 365. Okay, conclusion. Modern problems require modern solutions. It's hard to find traditional bugs in modern architecture. Sometimes comprehending the architecture from a higher point of view can help you find new interesting bugs. The Exchange CNS is still a good attack service, although Microsoft has patched it in April. However, in fact, we still find a few bugs after the Apple patch. But since the authentication part of this attack service is reduced, the result may not be as powerful as before due to the lack of pre os bugs. Lastly, the exchange is still a treasure waiting for you to find bugs. As mentioned, even in 2020, a hard-code crypto key 
can still be fired in Exchange Server. I can assure you that Microsoft will fix more Exchange vulnerabilities in the future. But here comes a spoil a lot. Even you find a super critical vulnerability like proxy logout, Microsoft will not reward you any bounty because the Exchange Server on Premius is out of scope. So is it was file hunting bugs on Exchange Server? You tell me. This is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, here is my contact information. By the way, I will post a detailed article on my blog. Please look forward to that. Thank you again for being here. Thanks.